H hello, Les. How are you? You all right? Hi, I'm Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. I'm fine. You've got yourself a good signal. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm out. I'm yeah. outside, so you might hear quite a lot of traffic. Oh, no, um, that's fine. That's fine. Thank, thank you for getting getting back to me. Um, no problem. Um, yes, um, it's your book. What does um, what can the Bible teach us? Yeah. It's a, yeah. It's a couple of things. Um, the first is the resurrection. I. When I went to church, I, I gave up about 10 years ago, um, we, we were taught that Jesus rose in the same body he died in. I'm thinking of right. John 1, 19, you know, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And then verse 21, yeah. but he was speaking of the temple of his body. And so that's the first thing, that Jesus rose in the same body he died in, not as a spirit. The second thing would be, um, Page 33 says all governments belong to Satan, and I was uneasy with that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. a little bit different than what we normally yes. would hear, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Did you, did you manage to read to the rest of the context of all of that? Sorry? Did you manage to read the, the context of that expression? Well, it's basically saying um, from the I, I downloaded scans of the watchtower today the 2020 watchtower number two yeah uh, i've got that on my screen here yeah uh i'm not so quick with uh, i'm actually at a place where i do have wi-fi here uh, oh, good. right it's saying uh preview watchtower 2020 number two page 11 the heading is what God's kingdom has already done and it's talking about the demons coming to this earth. The Bible says that on taking kingdom power Jesus will expel Satan and his demons from heaven. Their activity is now restricted to the earth which is one of the reasons why things have become so bad since the year 1914. So I think the book is teaching that the demons went from heaven to earth in 1914 and they now occupy other non-Jehovah's Witness religious groups as well as governments. Oh, oh I don't think it's... <laughs> no, right, yeah. Um, no, I think what... Um, to give you a better understanding... Have you got a Bible handy? I, I haven't, no. I'm, I'm, I, can, I know my Bible reasonably well. I can work from memory. I do have a laptop in front of me. Um, All right, Bible, Bible Gateway. Maybe I could go there. Um, let me show you, yeah. So that would be useful. Um, We've managed to, with modern technology, we're able to download the Bible onto our tablets as well. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't, this is a G, this is a G3 phone, so technically I don't actually oh, use right. it. Um, oh, very, right. very, very briefly, um, what are we going to look at? Which of those two things? Uh, Rev Revelation. No, um, which of those two words. topics? Um, well, we talk about the demons being um, down to the earth, yeah, but it, what I was going to look at. But it doesn't mention the year 1914. You know, no, no. Um, you, you see, I believe that Satan was defeated when Christ rose from the grave. Satan wasn't the victor at Jesus' resurrection. Satan was defeated when Jesus rose. So we need to have a faith that's centered on Christ, not centered on Satan and his demons. Um, Absolutely. I, I, I'm thinking of Colossians um, 2. Um, I think it's 14 and 15. Yeah. Oh gosh, this is quick. By cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. That's Colossians 2, 14, 15, New English Standard Version. So, yeah. you know, Satan was defeated by Christ's resurrection. We don't need, in the year 2020, to sort of focus on Satan and his demons. It's Jesus' victory we need to focus on, not, 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 not Satan, sir. So. Yeah, fair enough. Um, well, I was thinking about the Christ's death up till now. Who's responsible for that? Sorry, you say that again? We, we obviously still have a very wicked world around us since Christ's death. Who is responsible for the wickedness? Well, I, I, that, that's something I don't need to discuss. Uh, uh, I mean, that's axiomatic. Um, 
the book says all governments belong to Satan. Now, either that's true or it's not. I mean, you know, in Babylon, um, Daniel and the other Jewish teenagers, uh, they were involved in the Babylon government. Yet they were, you know, Daniel wasn't of the devil. Daniel loved and served Jehovah. Um, in Egypt, in the book of Genesis, um, Joseph served under Pharaoh in Egypt. So there's two people involved in two governments. So not everyone involved in every single government is of the devil. Les. No, I understand that. Um, but, so the, the government that Joseph was part of and the one that Daniel was part of, were they um, carrying out God's will? Sorry, you have to, you have to slow it. Just say that again. And the government that Daniel was part of and Joseph was part of, were they carrying out God's will? Well, no government perfectly carries out God's will. <laughs> the only government that's going to do that is Christ's kingdom that's going to be established after Armageddon. That's right. Right. But right. government authority is instituted by God. We know yeah, that because right. Romans 13 right. 1 right. says that. It's allowed to exist by God Romans 13, isn't it? You have, so, you have to speak up. It's to, it's, as you said, it's allowed to exist by God in Romans 13. But what's going to happen at uh, Armageddon then? Uh, no, let's look at Romans 13.1. I don't, I don't like to jump around. Let's actually read the verse. Let it, let every. Jump around, you've jumped around a fair bit already. Well, uh, uh, let, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those who exist have been instituted by God. Romans 13.1, New English Standard Version. So the governments that exist are instituted by God. They're not instituted by Satan. Um, the Watchtower 2020 seems to imply that the governments of this world and the religions of this world are somehow controlled or run in some way or under the influence of Satan. But Romans 13.1 says that the governments of the world have been instituted, government authority is instituted by God. Now that doesn't mean that every single thing that every single government does um, has God's approval on it. If a government does something contrary to the word of God, we're not to go along with that. And Christians should defy a government, be it a democracy, dictatorship, um, monarchy, whatever that government is, if the government tells you to do something that's wicked and contrary to the word of God. Um, but even Pilate uh, was told by Jesus that his, his own authority was from God. Jesus told Pilate, you could do nothing unless it had been granted you from above. Um, I think it's 19, I think it's somewhere in John 19, I think. John 19, 11. I'm, I'm, I'm not very good with these. Um, <laughs> I'm better working from memory. Yeah, Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. So even Jesus says to Pilate, you would have no authority over me unless it had been granted or given you from above. So it, Jesus even recognized um, the governmental authority that Pilate held. Well, we have to recognize the authority around us, don't we? Because as Romans 13 says, uh, a relative position to do could you just say some, could you just say that again sorry you need to I, I, I'm it's with traffic here it's a bit hard to hear at times I do apologize I'm cupping my hand over my ear I look a bit odd but <laughs> I can hear a bit more here, clearly but Romans 13 says that they're in it a relative position of authority they don't supersede God's authority but they do act as God's minister uh, on the earth at the moment, don't they? they so he's got to look after the regulations for, or look after people, otherwise it'd be chaos. That's just what I've said. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with you there. Right. And that's not, a, that's not an issue. <laughs> so, so, um, so your book says all governments belong to Satan on page 33. Yeah, well, it doesn't control the, of the world, it doesn't control the system. Sorry? Who's in control of this system? This world around us? 
um, well, the earth belongs to Jehovah. Christ is ruling, but he's ruling in the midst of his enemies, Psalm 110, verse 2. Wow. So you have two kingdoms. You have Christ's kingdom, which is a spiritual kingdom from heaven, but you have the kingdoms of the world here. Uh, there are some good Christian people involved in a variety of different governments, not many, but there are some. I know three good Christians in the British government. Um, and um, many people are indeed wicked. And there are many people involved in governments, democracies, dictatorships, republics, monarchies. There are many people involved in different types of governments who are indeed wicked, wicked people. But your book doesn't say most or some governments are of the devil. It says all governments are of the devil, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it probably does because, um, well, not probably, it does. Well, I've got that word in front of me, so yeah, okay, then it does. Um, I've got Second Corinthians 4, verse 4. Have you got that? Um, going there. Second Corinthians 4, 4. Bang. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. It's simply saying that the God of this world has blinded unbelievers. Yes. So who's the God of the world? The yes, well, it's obviously world. Satan, but he's not blinding Christians. He's he's blinding the unbelievers. Hmm? So, so what 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 is your definition of a Christian then? Um, someone who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Father, Can Son, and S sorry, if I could just say the f the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, indwells a Christian person in the New Covenant. Um, we find that prophesied of the Father and the Son in John fourteen twenty three. We will first person plural come to Him and make our abode with Him. And Romans uh, chapter eight verse nine talks about the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Um, this is the seal of the covenant, of the new covenant mentioned in um, Ephesians 1, roughly 13. Um, start of Ephesians, we read in Christ. We're in Christ, we're in him, we're in him, we're in Christ, in Christ. It's repeated over and over again. And then the summation of that in verse 13 um, is really summed up in verse 13. The Holy Spirit is the seal of the new covenant believer. But um, 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 is not talking about governments. It's not saying that every government is, is of the devil. It's, it's talking about the un, un, unbelievers. Their minds have been blinded by Satan. And I'm sure there are many unbelievers and people who've been blinded by Satan involved in all sorts of things, including different governments. I have no doubt at all about that. But this verse has 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. I mean, just, just read the verse. In, in, in their case, the God of the world... In fact, let me just go back to verse 1. Let's just look at the context from verse one. Whoops, I'm not very good with, I'm not very quick with computers. Um, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. We've renounced disgraceful underhand ways. Okay, so he's um, talking to Christians. This is an epistle. Um, we refuse to tamper with God's word. Um, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God, verse 3, even if our gospel is veiled, is veiled from those who are perishing, so now the context changes to the unbelievers who are lost. And it's saying that these people are perishing, well, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So it's a simple contrast, as at 1 John 5, 18 and 19, between people who, who've been born of God, or born, born from above, and people who haven't been born, born of God. Uh, no reference to either passage to government. There's no passage, either no, passage to it government. Makes a, it makes a simple statement, but there's, there's a God of this system of things. Sorry, can I just say that again? I'm, 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 I'm trying, I'm cupping my hands to here. It's making a simple statement there that the God of this system of things is not Jehovah. Yes, it's Satan. I, 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 I get it. I do actually get it. But it's saying that he's blinded the unbelievers. This is talking about unbelievers. It's a contrast between believers in verses 1 and 2, and then in verse 3 and 4, it's talking about unbelievers. So it's a contrast between believers who've been born of God. Just at 1 John 5, 18, you have people who've been born of God. And then um, in verse 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, 
and 1 Corinthians, no, 1 John 5, 19. There's the contrast, the unbelievers who haven't been born of God. So there's no reference to governments. You can't read governments into the text. This isn't some sort of proof text. I'm not that, trying to read I'm not yeah. trying to read government into the text. I'm just trying to illustrate that the God in control of the system things is not Jehovah, but the same. And so when you look at the system, what is the system made of? Um, where does it say system? And what does it say there? God of this world? God yes, system. God of this world, yes. And that's that's well, talking about that, unbelievers. It's, it's it's a contrast. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, talking about believers. Verse 3 and 4 talk about unbelievers. So it's a simple contrast between believers and unbelievers. Just as at 1 John 5, 18 and 19, you can't contrast between people who have been born of God and people who haven't been born of God. And that's individuals. It's not talking about governments. It's not saying they're, you know, the Egyptian government or the French government or the government of Rome or the government of Britannica. It's got nothing to do with governments. It's individuals who've been born of God and individuals who haven't been born of God. How about um, 1 John 5, 19? I've just mentioned that. In verse 18, the contrast is um, people who've been born of God. I mean, do you believe governments can be born of God? Do you believe the born, government of born, Egypt could be born of God? Born of God? What do you mean by that expression, born of God? You say that again, Les? What, what, what do you mean by that expression, born of God? Um, that's used in verse 18. I'll read it, because I don't like talking about the Bible without actually reading the verse. 1 John 5, 18 and 19. We know that anyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. So it's a simple contrast between believers who've been born of God or born from above in verse 18 and the first line of verse 19, right? We know that we are from God. We are, um, we know is a first person plural. So John's identifying himself with his readers in verse 18 and 19 by the verb we know, all right? And then the contrast is the whole world lies under the power of the wicked one. That's people who haven't been born of God. So there's no reference to the French government or the government of Rome or the government of Egypt. There's no reference to governments here at all. It's a contrast between individuals who've been born of God and individuals who haven't been born of God. Because Jesus didn't come into the world to save governments. He didn't come into the world to save the government of Egypt or to save the government of Gaul or to save the government of Rome. Well, that's true. But the point in verse 19, if I can just say, it makes the same point to me when I read it. That the, the person in control of this is a wicked one, the devil. Yeah. The whole yeah. world. Yeah. The, the so, whole world. The whole world is lying in the power of the wicked. So, does that include you? Does that include Jehovah's Witnesses? Are they under the whole world? Um, no. No, I don't think it does include me. And right. So, the whole world doesn't mean everyone then, does it? Unless you want to include every Jehovah's Witness and the governing body and say they're part of the whole world that lies under the sway of the wicked one. So whole world is simply a contrast between those who've been born of God. It's a simple contrast. Verse 18, we know, first person plural, that everyone who's been born of God does not keep on sinning or, or practice sin as a habit. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I've read a, one or two of the clever Greek scholars and that's what they say. It's, it's to keep on sinning as a habit, okay? So we know John's identifying himself with the readers. He doesn't say you, second person plural. He says we. He includes himself. We know that everyone who's been born of God doesn't keep on practicing sin. He who has been born of God protects him and the evil one doesn't touch him. Verse 19. We know, first person plural again, that we are from God. And here's the contrast. The people who haven't, the other people who haven't been born of God, that's the whole world that lies under the power of the wicked one. So it's a simple contrast between individuals who've been born of God and individuals who haven't been born of God. Um, Christ didn't come into the world to save governments. He didn't die on the tree to save governments. The Christian gospel is not about governments. It's, it's about the salvation of individual people. And some, uh, some people repent 
and come to faith in Christ and other people don't. And that's what this passage is talking about and that's what the earlier passage in um, Corinthians, was it 2 Corinthians 4.4 that you mentioned? It, it's simply a contrast between individuals who've been born of God and individuals who haven't been born of God. Right, um, I'm, I'm, you've lost me a little bit now, Robert. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you didn't come to say governs, I, I recognise, I understand that. Uh, but do you not think that that is all part of Satan's system that needs to be got rid of? I, I don't, I don't, I don't get up in the morning and focus on Satan. I focus on God. serving Jehovah God, not Satan. I'm not interested in Satan. You know, I, when I go into the kitchen and I get the cornflakes out, I don't worry Satan's hiding behind the cornflakes blocks. When I'm walking down the road and I'm passing trees, I don't worry that Satan might be behind one of the trees out to grab me. I don't focus on Satan. Satan was defeated when Christ rose from the grave. Remember that passage in um, uh, Colossians 2, 14 and 15? So Satan was defeated and he's a, de he, he, he's a defeated foe. Um, yes, yes, there are many people involved in governments who are wicked and I'm quite sure there are many people involved in governments who, who are indeed under the power of Satan. I've no doubt to Paul about that, um, but there are some good Christian people involved in governments and your book doesn't demonize some governments or some people in government. If your book said there are some people involved in governments who are of the devil, well I'd have to agree with your book. But your book doesn't say that. It says all governments belong to Satan. Now the word all means every single one. So if you're going to say that, you need to prove that. I mean, do you believe that that applies to the British government and to the head of the British government, Les, which is the Crown? Um, I believe all governments are under uh, the influence of Satan and his demons, basically. Um, well, I was asking about my government. I live in the Great Britain. And the head of the British right government. Well. Yeah, and, and, and okay, okay, and the head of the British government is the Crown, Her Majesty. So, do you believe that the British government, including the Crown, belongs to Satan? Well, I'm not, um, I don't know who, who you are, Robert. I'm not going to make a political statement like that. I'm just going to make a generalised one and say that all, all political elements are under Satan's control. Well, your book says all governments belong to Satan. That's a political statement. You're not neutral. Well, uh, if you're going to say every single fine. government, including my government, which I would assume includes the Crown, belongs to Satan, you need to, you know, you need to be able to prove that. Yeah, well... I, th I think uh, what we've said already is sufficient for me to be comfortable at um, that's what I believe. <laughs> so so which, um, which verse in the Bible says that my government, the British government, and the Crown, which is the head of the British government, is somehow uh, under the power or, or belongs to Satan in some way? I'm not happy with that, I feel it's very disrespectful, but could you, could you show me that? Um, well, I could... Um, Try and find something specific for you. If you let me call you back. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Um, it, it would prove that in yes, I, I'm, I'm happy in myself that um, the government are under Satan's control. That includes all political elements. Um, and so, if you want to include Britain in that, and um, obviously when the Bible was written, Britain wasn't an empire. Um, but, it, but, 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 but Daniel was involved in politics. He was involved in the Babylon government. He wasn't of the devil. He loved Jehovah. Joseph in right. Egypt loved Jehovah God. Okay, he was a servant of Jehovah God. He was a faithful, good man. Um, also, even in the even in the New Testament times, um, there was a uh, there was a guy called Erastus. Romans sixteen twenty three. If I can find the verse. He was a city treasurer. Now he was a city treasurer in a Roman city. He was part of the Roman government, yet he's a Christian brother. Romans 16, 23. Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother, Quartus, greets you. So it says, Erastus, the city treasurer. He's a Christian. He's named with the other Christians, Christian believers. 
he's not named as somebody who's of the devil, even though he has a he has a government position. He's a he has a senior government position as the city treasurer. So, so let me explain to you then, Robert. If if I if I if I work for the HMRC, are you seeing me as a member of the government? What's HMRC? I don't know what that is. Uh, uh, the tax, tax, oh. the, the customs and excise. All right. If I work, if I work for the customs and excise, which is a, a tree or a branch of the government, would you think I was working, uh, I was a part of the government? Um, in a very junior way, like a junior police officer, I, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, it did not um, Daniel and Joseph work in a, a junior way? No, Daniel and Joseph were very senior. Daniel was the third ruler in the kingdom, and Joseph was the second ruler in the kingdom after Pharaoh. So they held, they held extremely high positions. All I'm pointing out is in Romans 16.23, Erastus is a Christian brother, and yet he holds a government position that's fairly senior as the city treasurer. It's not the same as being a, a clerk who, who works in the HMRC tax office. Uh, this guy's the head of it. He's the head of the, um, the treasury in that city. So it's a fairly high position. Yeah, he's a Christian brother. All I'm trying to point out to you is there are some good Christian people in the British government. You know, not everyone in every single government is of the devil. And not every government... I, d I do believe there's a lot of wickedness in this world, and I do believe there's a lot of wickedness in politics, and I believe there's a lot of wickedness in religion. And I don't agree with everything that every government does, and I don't agree with everything that my government does. But I'm just pointing out there are some good Christian people in the British government. I know an MP. Um, I used to know him 25 years ago when he was in his father's Pentecostal church, Steve Double. And he's the MP for St. Austell and, and Newquay. Um, he's a believer in Jesus, at least he was when I knew him 25 years ago. Hope he's matured since then, because he was in a, his father's, he was the leader in his father's Pentecostal church. Um, Anne Whittacombe, I heard a talk that she gave in Foy many years ago, and I was very impressed with her strong Christian testament. I don't know if she's still alive. But she was um, a lady uh, who. I don't know. I can't, I can't remember when she died, you know. She was a member oh, of the Conservative government, but she clearly. Yes, yeah, so I, I remember. I'm with yeah, them. yeah. She was clearly, um, you know, a person who had a strong Christian vocation and faith. Um, and then Her Majesty the Queen has talked about her faith in Jesus and Jesus's resurrection from from the grave. So there's three good Christian people involved in the British government, and I don't think so you've got what, the right. What, what, what about? Uh, what about um, a simple thing like going to war then? Well... Would you, go to, would you go to war? No, no, I think most of the wars are fought for um, financial reasons. I don't think they're fought for moral reasons, and I think many of the wars... Uh, I'm talking in general terms, not in specific terms. I don't think they're fought no. for moral, moral reasons at all. It's just e economic advancement for some rich person um, well, in two, the kingdom. Would two, would two genuine Christians go to war? Forever the big so-called reason. Well, look, if if someone is um, going to invade your home and hurt your wife and children, I think a man has a right to defend um, himself. Even even Jesus to Peter said, "You can take up the sword." That's not to any way demean the utter hypocrisy that we find in a lot of wars. I mean, in the First World War. Um, after the First World War, many European men, not so much the Americans, they came into the war late in 1917, but many Europeans, men, who fought in the trenches, and of course the women didn't fight in the trenches, they stayed home. They heard the vicars and the priests on the other side blessing the troops before they went over the top. Jesus will bless you, Jesus is with you. And then their own vicars and priests did exactly the same thing. And that's one reason why after the First and Second World War, so many European men abandoned Christianity en masse when they thought of the hypocrisy they saw from these religious leaders in the trenches. Oh, no. um, Shocking, isn't it? And with the European churches um, not attracting so many men, um, they became feminized and they went in a sort of liberal direction with the women taking over and becoming lovey-dovey. Um, not so in America. Americans came into the war late, so you still have 
um, more men in American churches than you do in European churches. Um, but America went down a different route. It went down the route of um, what's called dispensationalism. Um, the Bible fundamentalist got to take that Bible literally, and that has problems as well because they don't take it literally. <laughs> um, they follow a system known as dispensationalism, um, and it would take a long time to not long time to go into it. I mean, with regard to Jehovah's Witnesses, um, Jehovah's Witnesses have derive share income from arms companies which also the Catholics and the Anglicans have in their pension funds but the Jehovah's Witnesses through the Henrietta M. Riley Trust derive share dividends from arm companies like Boeing and Northrop Grumman that make military equipment so okay you don't fight in wars but your leaders are happy to receive money from arms companies to me that's just no different you know if you're gonna, if you're gonna get money from arms companies then you might as well fight in wars yeah, no, I, agree. I, I would have to disagree with what you just said there. Um, we, have uh, you looked at the Henrietta M. Riley Trust? Never even heard of it. <laughs> you'll, you'll have to take a look at that. But you'll find that they... they um, in fact, I actually got today um, the um, uh, 2017 accounts for the Henrietta M. Riley Trust. They've been, they haven't been getting so much money. It was just under 700,000 in 2015. Then it went down to, I think, just over half a million bucks. And now it's gone down by a little bit more. So they're not getting so much money from their investments, which is a huge portfolio of investments, but it also includes arms companies. Um, the other thing is, um, even the Watchtower itself admits that the Jehovah's Witnesses during the Second World War um, supported the military by working in armaments companies. Now again, if you, you might not fight, um, you, you might not fight, sorry about the noise, you might not fight as soldiers in wars, but the, I've got it here, a, I, I'm, I'm a scanner, so I tend to, when I learn things, I scan them into the computer, and I've got thousands of scans for thousands of different, for many, many religious groups. This is the watch now, 1st of June, 1947, page 173. And it's talking about the situation in Australia, so this isn't worldwide. What happened was, if you read the article from the start, um, the Bethel headquarters had called in Jehovah's Witnesses to work full time, but due to, due to the war, it was decided to get them working in secular employment, earning money. And so it talks, there were others who had been called in for work who became so busy with printing things pertaining to this world, that means working in printing shops. Also working in machine shops, producing instruments of war or serving soldiers in canteens that they soon lost their appreciation for the truth and were lost in the sea, eventually drifting back into the world no longer having a desire for the good things of the Lord and his full-time ministerial service. So it says that in Australia, this is only, this is the situation in Australia which wasn't very good during the Second World War. This watchtower from two years later, 1947, is saying that the Australian brothers were working in machine shops producing instruments of war. Now that's talking about the Taylorcraft Aircraft Corporation. Taylorcraft was owned by a Jehovah's Witness, uh, it was owned by two brothers, one of them. Uh, oh. <laughs> one of them died in one. One of them died in 1928 testing a new plane called a Chummy because it was an aircraft corporation. So the other Taylor brother ran the corporation on his own from 1928 onwards. And during the Second World War, of course, all the. Um, of course, he did what Jehovah's Witnesses have always done. If you have a carpet company, a cleaning company, or a window cleaning company, you employ other Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, Mr. Taylor, who was a Jehovah's Witness and was very rich, employed um, Jehovah's Witnesses to work in his factory. And during the Second World War, all the aircraft production was turned over away from civilian aircraft to military aircraft. So in Australia in the Second World War, this watchtower, 1st of June 1947, um, 173 says that they were working in machine shops producing instruments of war. So you might not fight as soldiers but you get share div dividends from arms companies and during the Second World War they're quite prepared to work um, well, producing they, they work. military equipment. Um, those chaps that went to work for the Taylor company then I, I, 
they see that they're individually did, but it's not Jehovah's Witness policy. It, it, it was. It was policy only in Australia. And when the Second World oh. War was over, um, the uh, American headquarters in this article, you know, they weren't too happy about what happened. I, I think I read no. about this also in the 1982 yearbook about the problems with uh, in Australia during the Second World War. But I mean, the Watchtower itself says Jehovah's Witnesses during the Second World War were working in military canteens, okay, on military basis, and they were producing, they were working in machine shops producing instruments of war. That's a quote. So you were producing so military tell, equipment. Tell, tell me, Rob, you obviously have a lot of information on Jehovah's Witnesses. What, what, what is your connection? Oh, I've never been a Jehovah's Witness. I was an evangelical Christian. And in the uh, 1980s, um, I got involved briefly in a group called Oneness or Jesus Only, which is a form of anti-Trinitarian Pentecostalism. I was in that for nine or ten months, and then I left and um, became a very passionate Trinitarian. I became a very passionate Trinitarian, yeah. Um, I tended to keep, I te I've tended to keep away from churches. Whenever I've got involved, it's caused me no end of trouble. Um, yeah, yeah. But I find a lot of people in the churches have no passion, and there's just nothing I'm going to get from it. There's no fellowship, there's no camaraderie. Um, often, uh, well, I, I could go on, I, I just don't really think there's anything there. In, in, most of, in most of these churches, unfortunately. I, I do believe there's genuine, genuine Christians in all of the churches. I'm not saying everyone in every church is lost. Of course, there are genuine Christians in the Methodist and the Anglicans and Baptist and Pentecostals, even a few in the Catholics. Um, I just don't believe there's many genuine on-fire Christians in organized religion. So, so what, what, what are you hoping for then? Oh, I want to obey Jehovah God. I want to do the will of Jehovah. Because yeah, I, I believe yeah. the end is, is coming soon. It might be, you right. know, it doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. It might be another 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. But, um, what what convinces you of that then? Um, reading the Bible. Right. Reading What's the Bible. What's the sign that Jesus spoke about? Or? Um, well, it would take a long time to go to go through it. I'm not an expert on prophecy by any stretch of the imagination. It is, it is rather rather difficult. Why, um, why do you think it's in the next 10 or 20 years and not in 100 years time, for example? Sorry? Sorry? Why do you think, why do you think it would be in the next 10 or 20 oh, or 30 years? Oh, goodness me, that's, just, that's just a number off the top of my head. I, I, I Honestly, no, right. I, I don't know when Jesus Christ is going to return. But uh, I don't think it's going to be tomorrow. And I don't think we're going to have to wait two, three hundred years. I think it's going to be some some date between those two figures. So I just said t uh, 10, right. 20, okay. 30, 50 years. So I think that's uh, a, a fair guess, 10, 10 to 50 years. Who knows? But um, look, um, um, thank you very much for your time. It's difficult to speak out here. Um, I, I'm also looking at the resurrection, which is important to me. Um, I believe that Christ rose in the same body he died in and that's a bit different to what I read in your book if you'd like to speak another time maybe we could look at the resurrection um, yeah I just don't know that there's much point to be honest I think um, you're obviously um, um, quite determined in your views I'm quite fixed in my views um, I, I can see you've still got a lot of your Pentecostal thinking um, which obviously conflicts with, with my, my view. So if, if, you, if you're not thinking what Jehovah's Witnesses teach, I don't see any point. Well, I've read uh, your book. I've gone to the yeah, trouble of reading your book. You've done well, you've done well with it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, well, you've well, look, you've obviously done well, but yeah. you, I, I think... Well, um, look, the the offer well. is the offer is there. If you want to speak again, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. But it's going to have to be at home because it really is quite quite noisy here with the traffic, and I have found yeah. it a bit hard following you at times because of all the traffic noise. And I right. think forty okay. minutes is quite enough because I've had to concentrate quite a lot for this. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I certainly appreciate your, your, your comment. Um, you obviously genuinely in your beliefs, and I appreciate that. All right, thank you. Um, just keep reading your Bible, and we'll, we'll hit the truth one day.
All right, well, it would be nice to speak to you again, but I'll, I'll leave it up to your decision there. All right. But if you do, you I won't much. discuss this topic again. I, I'm, I, that's one thing I do. I will move on and discuss something else, and it would be oh, the resurrection right. or the Trinity. I'm a very passionate Trinitarian. You believe in the Trinity? Yeah? Absolutely, yeah. Oh, all right, okay. So if you want to discuss that, I can explain why I believe that. But that would have to be for another time, and you'd have to text me in yeah. advance. So, yeah. well, you know, I'm not, I'm you can't just... Discussing the Trinity, to be honest. Sorry? <laughs> Sorry? Well, I'm, I'm not even interested in discussing the Trinity. Okay. Well, what well, about I, the resurrection? I'll you anyway. What about, what about, well, the, re I, what about I, the resurrection? I, I think we'll just leave it at that. All right. Well, All right. Thank, fine. All right. Thank you, Les. Thank All you, the best. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.